Well, before we begin, let me read two or three verses in the 12th chapter of John's Gospel. You'll know these words well, I'm sure. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Let us pray. Lord, as we spend these brief moments reflecting on the life, the fragrant life of your faithful servant, Amy Carmichael, we pray that what we hear will speak into our lives, that your voice will sound, that your truth will lodge within us, that we may not leave this session as we have come but leave with a greater resolve to live to the praise and honor of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amy Carmichael, I'll assume that you don't know overly much about her. Uh, So my apologies if you're an expert on the life and times of Amy Carmichael. I'll assume you don't know over much. My aim is to give a brief, briefish overview of her life and ministry in India, and then to look at a number of lessons that we can learn from her life. She was born in 1867, and she died in 19. 51. She served in India for 55 years, never returning home for one furlough. 55 unbroken years of service. Early on in her time in India, Amy received a letter from a lady in England who was seriously considering giving her life to missionary work. And in her letter, she asked Amy, what is it like to be a missionary? And Amy replied, missionary life is simply a chance to die. Now, when I first read those words, they reminded me of those words I read in the 12th chapter of John's Gospel. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, It remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. I remember vividly the first meaningful counter I had with the writings of Amy Carmichael. A friend of mine was reading her poem with the title, Hast Thou No Scars? And I was so impacted by the poem, uh, I went home and memorized it. Let me read to you some of the lines in Amy's poem, Hast Thou No Scars? Hast thou no scars, no scar on hand or foot or side? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar, no wound, no scar? But as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far who has no wound, no scar? Amy Carmichael was an Ulster Scot, born in 1867 in Northern Ireland, 
to relatively wealthy Christian parents. At the age of 12, she was sent to a boarding school in England, and three years later, she wrote in a letter home these words, in his great mercy, the good shepherd answered the prayers of my mother and father and many other loving ones and drew me, even me. Amy was like so many uh, eminent Christian servants. They, they rarely tell much about the circumstances of how they came to faith because that, in a sense, was very secondary. The significant thing was not how you come to faith, but that you have come to faith and that your life shows that you have come to faith. But from that moment on, age of about 15 or so, Amy devoted herself to living for Christ and to serving the cause of the gospel. And Amy's personal call to sacrificial missionary service actually began with a very mundane, very ordinary incident. She was heading for church one Sunday and she saw an old woman carrying a heavy burden that was just causing her to bend under its weight. And as she watched this old woman with her heavy burden, Amy thought of the words that we read in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 14. That one day she would stand before God and give an account of her life. Would her life be a life of wood, hay, and stubble? Or would her life exhibit precious stones, gold, silver? One biographer writes from this period of her life, everything for Amy Carmichael was judged by this plumb line, will it count for eternity? Will it count for eternity? I've often thought that the way God works in the lives of his people is so most often mundane and ordinary. Very rarely is it spectacular. He, he uses the ordinary circumstances of life to minister his truth and his grace into our lives. And it's this incident of this old woman with a heavy burden that perhaps crystallized for Amy the question, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing to help people who don't just have heavy physical burdens, but who are being weighted down with the spiritual burdens of guilt and judgment and the prospect of a lost eternity. As a young woman, Amy had a special burden for uh, a group of women who were called the Shawleys, S-H-A-W-L-I-E-S, -E women who worked in the local factories manufacturing shawls. And the conditions were dreadful and Amy became something of an evangelist to these women, and God richly blessed her spiritual concern for these women, and soon over 500 were attending the special services that she and others in her Presbyterian church had arranged, and God was using Amy greatly in her own native land. But like fellow Presbyterians, John Gibson Payton, and we'll hear about him tomorrow, and William Chalmers Burns, Amy felt God was preparing her for gospel work far from her native land. As we heard from Brooks earlier, she had far to go. 
In 1887, she heard Hudson Taylor speak at the Keswick Convention in the northwest of England, and she was persuaded that God was calling her to go and make disciples. Her first thought was to offer herself to the China Inland Mission that Hudson Taylor uh, founded. But CIM thought her health was too delicate to be effective amidst the rigors and the trials and the physical burdens that missionary life would impose upon her. You're far too delicate for hard labor missionary work, they told her. But Amy was undeterred. She was persuaded, notwithstanding, that God had laid his hand on her and was calling her to go. She didn't quite know where, but to go. In 1893, she travels, first of all, to Japan, but that doesn't quite work. Then she goes to Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, and that worked for a short time. And all the while, she's battling with delicate health. She battles with delicate health all her days. She wasn't a naturally robust woman. And because of her health, she goes to recuperate in Bangalore in India. And in the sovereign providence of God, it was there that Amy became convinced of her life's calling. And until her death in 1951, Amy devoted herself to bringing the gospel of God's saving grace in Christ, especially to the multitudes of young women who had been sold into temple prostitution and servile slavery. While she was still learning the difficult Tamil language, Amy commenced itinerant evangelism with a band of Indian Christian women guided by the, the CMS, the Anglican missionary, uh, Thomas Walker. Amy was, was unusual. Um, she didn't follow the orthodox pattern into missionary life. There are times when God breaks the mold and we should always be willing and open to mold breakers, people who don't conform to the precise pattern that is laid down for us. Scripture gives us the general pattern that Brooks was um, highlighting to us and setting before us in the first address this morning. But we must always be open to the unusual and the unexpected. So Amy begins itinerant evangelism with a band of Indian uh, Christian women. And before long, she finds herself responsible for Indian women converts. And in 1901, she, um, the Walkers, Thomas Walker and his wife, and their Indian colleagues settled in the place that she would become inextricably identified with for the rest of her life, the village of Donavur in southern India. Amy resolved to let nothing hinder her missionary calling. And she did what was completely unheard of. She adopted Indian dress. Her skin was very pale and so she used coffee, ground coffee, in a mixture to rub it into her face so that she wouldn't be so um, readily marked out as a foreigner. Now, Hudson Taylor and William Chalmers Burns did something similar earlier. In China, they began to wear Chinese dress. That was thought to be unbecoming at the time. But she wanted to become literally all things to all men and women that she might, through God, by all means, save some. 
the Donavour Fellowship's ministry among the female outcasts in Indian society became known far and wide. And quite rapidly, she began to take in hundreds of unwanted children. And what she would do is she would smuggle them out of the temples when no one was looking. She hazarded her life to rescue poor, benighted women and children from lives of unimaginable degradation. On at least one occasion, uh, when it seemed certain that she would be arrested by the authorities, uh, she managed in the good providences of God to, to escape. Uh, on one occasion, she, she was formally charged with kidnapping, but then received a letter that all charges had been dropped without any explanation. By the mid-1930s, Amy had become crippled and permanently bedridden following a nasty fall. So she has this delicate um, constitution and it's now exacerbated by her being crippled and bedridden. And yet, and yet, it's arguably those last 25 years or so as a crippled, bedridden woman that God used her life subsequently to touch myriads of lives in the years that followed. Because as she lay bedridden, she began to write, to write books and to write poems. Perhaps some of you have her books. And as they were published, they, they brought inspiration and challenge not just to other women, but to men as well. And people were stirred by her, her, her heightened devotion to Christ that gave her the resolve to give herself without reservation to Christ, that those writings became an impulse under God to touch many lives to give up their small ambitions and to go and preach the gospel of Christ. It was her life as well as her ministry that was such a striking witness to all of the people who encountered her. The myriads of children, the hundreds and latterly the thousands that she, under God, was able to not only rescue from degradation and temple prostitution and worse, but also see them one to faith in Jesus Christ. That these multitudes began to refer to her as Amma, mother. And one of her best known sayings sums up her life. One can give without loving, but one cannot love without giving. As we bring this just brief initial overview of her life to a close, the words of one of her prayers have echoed in my own life and have been used by God to touch many lives, I think. Let me read to you one of her prayers. God, harden me against myself, the coward with, path with pathetic voice who craves for ease and rest and joy, myself, arch traitor to myself, my hollowest friend, my deadliest foe, my clog, whatever road I go. 
I think in those words of her prayer, she is echoing exactly what the Apostle Paul writes at the end of Romans 7, 14 through 25. The good that I would, I do not. The evil that I would not, that I do. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Paul, as you remember there, is, is reflecting on the internal struggle that he experiences day after day after day as he seeks to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. My greatest enemy lies within. My greatest traitor is myself. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Amy Carmichael understood that while the gospel of God's grace in Jesus Christ has wonderfully, gloriously, magnificently rescued and delivered us from sin's guilt and its prevailing power, it has not yet delivered us from sin's presence. It remains to trouble us, to humble us. And you remember how after the end of Romans 7, Paul in Romans 8, 13 says, if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. You know, people often speak of Romans 8 as the great chapter about the Spirit of God and the great blessings the Holy Spirit brings to us in union with Christ climaxing in the glorious blessing of our adoption in Christ. But what's often missed is that in the midst of that, Paul writes of the ministry of the Holy Spirit coming to help us mortify, put to death, kill the sin that yet remains within us to trouble us and humble us and hold us back. And so Amy says, God harden me against myself, the coward with pathetic voice who craves for ease and rest and joy, myself, arch traitor to myself. She dies in 1951. What lessons can we learn from the life of Amy Carmichael? A number of years ago, Elizabeth Elliot made this striking comment about the impact of Amy Carmichael's life on her own life. And when I first read this, it struck me. And I remember, if I remember rightly, stopping what I was reading to ponder what Elizabeth Elliot was saying. She wrote, Amy Carmichael showed me the shape of godliness. It's a very striking phrase, isn't it? The shape of godliness. And what I really want to ask now is, what was the shape of godliness in Amy Carmichael's life that so impacted and shaped Elizabeth Elliot's life? Now, if you know your Bibles at all, you'll know that The Christian life has a shape. Uh, In Romans 6, 17, our English translations don't quite, I think, capture uh, the force of, of the Greek that Paul is using. But he tells us there in Romans 6, 17 that the gospel has come and has poured us into a mold. Not a mold whereby we all become like one another. Uh, We remain the unique individuals we are. Um, you know, the French of the phrase, vive la différence. We're all sui generis. We're all one of a kind. We're unique. There's nobody else like us in all the world. And yet, in our uniqueness and in our idiosyncrasy, we are poured into a mold. There is a definite shape to gospel life and gospel godliness. I think our English translations use the word standard, the standard of teaching to which we have been called. It's really the the shape, the mold of teaching. And 
the gospel comes to in an idiosyncratic way, because we don't stop being who we are when we become Christians. You know, if you're dull before you're converted, you'll be generally dull after you're converted. And that's the way God made us. Now, you, you try not to be dull, but you know, we are the way God made us. And the gospel comes to slowly, often painfully, conform us to the likeness of Jesus Christ. And it was this shape of godliness that so impacted Elizabeth's early life. So I I just want to ask, what was the shape of Amy Carmichael's devoted to Christ life? What was that shape? What did it look like? Because that's what godliness is, devotion to Jesus Christ in the individuality of who you are. Well, the first thing I want to say is this. Amy Carmichael's life was shaped by her love to Jesus Christ. In his excellent, if brief, biography of Amy Carmichael's life, Ian Murray writes, closer attachment to Christ is the great message of Amy Carmichael's writings. Closer attachment to Christ. The gospel comes not just to justify us, though it comes to do that. It comes to bring us into an ever-deepening relationship with and love for our Savior and our King, Jesus Christ. Love to the Savior is the first and greatest grace that any would-be missionary must have and show in their lives. Nothing will more sustain a soldier of the cross than love to the captain of their salvation. Now, Don't misunderstand me. Absolute trust in the Word of God, absolute dependence on the grace of God are absolutely indispensable, aren't they? But it is love to Jesus that will sustain a weary, struggling foot soldier in the heat of the battle. Let me try and illustrate it from the life of the Apostle Peter. Remember, Peter denies the Lord three times. He has said, I I will never fail you. Though they all desert you, you can count on me. Even if I have to die with you, I will never desert you. And then when he finds himself in the providence of God in the crucible of trial, he denies his Savior with curses. Fast forward after the resurrection. The Lord Jesus is with Peter and restores him. Now, if I were to ask you, why did Peter fail so lamentably? Why did he crash so tragically? Why why did his trust in Christ so collapse under a servant girl's You're one of them, aren't you? I would guess many of us would instinctively say it was a collapse of courage. He was not the courageous disciple he thought that he was. And there's some truth in that, isn't there? But when the Lord Jesus begins to restore Peter, he doesn't say to him, Peter, do you promise from now on to be courageous? and loyal. He goes to the heart of the matter. Peter, do you love me? Then a second time, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And then the third time, mirroring the threefold denial, Peter, Do you love me? 
Jesus is showing us that Peter's collapse was not a collapse ultimately of courage. It was a collapse of love. You know, sometimes you, you go to the doctor and you've got, a, I don't know, a, a problem in your, your wrist. I've got a problem with my wrist at the moment. I don't know what, what's happened, but problem with my wrist. You go to the doctor and say, I've, I've got this bad wrist. Can you? Oh, and he examines you and he says, oh, yeah, I see. Um, I'm going to give you treatment for your knee. And you look at the doctor and you say, uh, excuse me, uh, no, my knee's fine. <laughs> my knee's not the problem, it's my wrist doctor. Doctor says, yeah, yeah, you think it's your wrist. The problem begins with your knee, it's coming out at your wrist. It's called referred pain. And that's what it was with Peter. It seemed the great problem was a collapse of courage, but it was a failure of love. I remember reading, oh goodness, decades ago, John, one of John Calvin's comments on uh, the work of an elder, and he says this, the work of an elder, and by that he meant pastor, the primary work and calling of a pastor is to love Jesus Christ. I never forget reading those words. I'd been a pastor for some years, and thought I was doing a good job, seeking to be faithful in a mixed denomination. And then, reading those words, the first calling of a pastor is to love the Savior, because that will bring an overflow of life out of your ministry, spoken and lived to the people. So that's the first shape of godliness, um, devotion to Jesus Christ for who he is and what he had done and what he was presently doing and what he will yet do, devotion to the person of Christ. We mustn't divorce the person of Christ from the benefits of Christ. People talk about, you know, I, I, I sometimes put it like this, we must never tell people that we are justified by faith. We're not justified by faith, are we? We're justified by Jesus Christ, whom we receive by faith. Jesus Christ is the salvation of God. He is the salvation of God. And he is to be loved. Yes, obeyed, of course, we'll see this in a moment, but first and foremost, my son, give me your heart. And then secondly, Amy's life was shaped by an undeviating obedience to Christ. Now, there are many examples of this in her life. Get in Murray's little biography. You can read it in two or three hours. But one example stands out and there's a reason why it stands out for me. The Church Missionary Society that she was now under their umbrella, the Church Missionary Society, CMS, was the, the main um, Anglican uh, Church of England uh, mission, uh, really throughout the world. And the Church Missionary Society proposed to send Stephen Neal to assist her in the work at Donovour. Amy wasn't an ordained minister. She didn't pretend to be and didn't administer sacrament. She didn't preach. And she was willing to receive any help that could be given. The work was expanding. She needed help. She wasn't an ordained pastor. Stephen Neal was a, an eminent Christian scholar. He was raised in India. His parents were, he was a missionary kid. He had become an eminent scholar back in England, and he wanted to return to India. But Amy refused to have him in the work at Donavour. Now, why would she do this? He was a gifted Christian scholar. He, he was from a missionary society. He spoke Hindi and other languages, I think. 
Wouldn't he be just a great asset? Why did she say no? Because she was committed to God's written infallible word and Stephen Neal had embraced in some measure the new teaching from Germany that no longer saw the Bible as infallibly true. In the Bible, there were great truths, he would say. It's a book of God, but there's an admixture in it. And we have to sift the wheat from the chaff. And although it would be costly for her to do so, Amy would not have someone in the work who questioned the absolute authority of the Bible. You see, the shape of godliness puts truth before consequences. Maybe that's something increasingly in the Western world we will need to take to heart. The shape of godliness puts truth before consequences. A third feature to the shape of godliness that so impacted Elizabeth Elliot was that Amy saw men and women as the Bible sees them, without hope and without God. She believed the truths of God's holiness, his hatred of sin, his resolve to punish sin, She believed in the solemn, awful, unimaginable reality of hell. And this was disappearing in the early decades of the 20th century from the Christian church throughout the Western world. In 1910, there was the first great world missionary conference held in Edinburgh in Scotland. And it was supposed to be a high watermark in the modern missionary movement. Mary Slessor, I hope you maybe know that name. If you don't, Google it. In my day, you had to go to a library and get a book and find out about it. Now you can Google it. Mary Slessor reflected on this 1910 World Missionary Conference. And she wrote, where are the men? Are there no heroes in the making among us? No hearts beating high with the enthusiasm of the gospel? Men smile today at the old-fashioned idea of sin and hell and broken law and perishing world. But these truths made men, men of purpose, men of power and achievement, and self-denying devotion to the highest ideals the earth has known. I can still remember the occasion, I was a young Christian, I may mention it tomorrow morning, When I read a little book, The Banner of Truth, published entitled Five Pioneer Missionaries, John Eliot, David Brainerd, William Chalmers Burns, um, Henry Martin, and one of them in particular focused one of the chapters on William Chalmers Burns. Now, we're allowed heroes. I've got two great heroes, John Calvin. (laughs) and William Chalmers Burns. William Chalmers Burns was a young theological student in Edinburgh. His father was a godly minister. He had come himself to to saving faith and ultimately he goes to China. But one day, As a young student, he's walking through the streets of Glasgow, and as I was reading the account of this, I could picture the street he was walking along. I know it well. I have it in my mind's eye at this moment. It was a busy street, perhaps the busiest street in Glasgow, which is a, a teeming city at the time, about maybe one million. And his mother saw him walking towards her through the crowds, And she was looking forward to seeing her boy, and suddenly he disappeared. 
And she wondered where he had gone. He hadn't passed her. So she began looking up the little alleyways and there she saw him, breaking his heart, floods of tears. And his mother said, William, William, what ails you? What's wrong with you? And he said, oh mother, when I saw the multitudes posting hither and thither, I had to turn aside and cry to God for their salvation. He was weeping for the lostness of the lost. I've never forgotten that. Joan and I moved to Cambridge from a small semi-depressed mill town south of Glasgow. We moved to Cambridge, one of the great university cities in the world, and Cambridge is thronged with people from all over the globe. At times you can hardly move as you're trying to navigate your way through the various colleges. And how often I would think to myself, why, why can't you just move out the way and let me get where I'm going? And very, very often, those words of William Chalmers Burns would pierce my cold, indifferent heart. Oh, mother, when I saw the multitudes posting hither and thither, heading for a lost eternity, I had to turn aside and cry to God. And here am I saying, will you part and let me pass? Amy Carmichael believed in eternal realities. A fourth, and I'll close with this, a fourth feature of Amy's life that so impacted Elizabeth Elliot was her readiness to suffer for Christ. As I mentioned, in 1931, Amy had an accident which seriously debilitated and restricted her for the rest of her life. But she was undaunted. I sometimes think Amy Carmichael should be more honored for her doggedness than her giftedness. As she lay in bed, crippled, she practiced what she had preached and lived. God is sovereign. He loves his children. He knows what's best for his children. He can be trusted Always. Now that's easier said than done. We probably all know people within our families or friends or people we pray for who in the sovereign, inexplicable providences and purposes of God have been brought into unimaginable spheres of difficulty and trial and suffering. And yet, our God reigns our God reigns, all things, all things, he will work together for the good of those who love him. And that's what it means to live by faith and, and not by sight. Amy Carmichael believed that her sufferings were not incidental to the work of the gospel but in the sovereign purpose and wisdom of God were woven into his purposes to bless many through the gospel. Someone has written of Amy Carmichael's lifelong sacrificial usefulness. Lifelong sacrificial usefulness. That's why those words in John 12, 24 are almost always in my mind when I think about Amy Carmichael. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. And it takes us back to where we began when that English lady wrote to Amy and said, what's missionary work like? And she replies, it gives you the chance to die. And she's thinking, isn't she, of 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 12. We don't have time to look at that. Always carrying in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. 
You know, the Christian life is, is lived at the intersection of two synchronous truths. 2 Corinthians 2.14, we are always being led in Christ's triumphal procession. Always, not some of the time, not most of the time, not time when things are going well. We are always being led on in Christ's cosmic triumph. And yet at the same time, two chapters later, he says, we are always carrying in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. And he's not saying some of the time we're in triumph and then some of the time we're, we're in trial. No, he's saying synchronously, not sequentially. Synchronously, we're being led always in triumph. And at the same time, always carrying about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. William Borden, perhaps he's not a name that, how many of you have heard the name William Borden? One, two, three, four, wonderful, five. William Borden of Yale. He was a wealthy young man and the Lord brought him to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And he had set his heart on going to Burma. But he was persuaded to put that off for some time and to travel throughout the United States, summoning young men, as John G. Payton would do, summoning young men to give up their small ambitions and go out east and preach the gospel of Christ. But then the day came when he left that behind and he set sail. He left New York. They were heading, first of all, for, for Egypt, Suez Canal, and then onwards and round India and up, up to Burma. And the first great port of call was Alexandria in Egypt. And William Borden was struck down with cerebral encephalitis. He would never see Burma. He would die in Alexandria. And as he lay dying, three doctors came to his bedside and were looking at him and his hopeless condition. And one of the doctors said, what a waste. What a waste. And humanly speaking, here's this young man, so bursting with promise and ability and passion, he has longed to get to Burma and be a missionary of Jesus Christ and He's going to die in Alexandria. What a waste. William Borden was very weak. But he lifted himself up as high as he could. And he said to the three doctors, no retreat, no reserve, no regrets. No retreat, no reserve, no regrets. That's the life that missionaries are called to. Lord, we are poor, poor reflections of the people that you have saved us to be and called us to be, but by your grace, Lord, we long to be better than we are. We thank you for the holy, godly examples of faithful men and women like Amy Carmichael. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us the grace to be faithful, to give ourselves unreservedly to you, to go wherever you would call us to, to be whatever you would call us to be. And we ask it in our Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen.